Andrew Washburn is the museum registrar here at the Alaska State Museum, but he's talking with us today as uh, wearing a different hat as the vice president of the Cape Decision Lighthouse Society. And all right, thanks, Claire. Um, wow, there's so many more people here than I expected. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, thrilled to talk on uh, a subject that I like to think about a lot. Um, one thing I'd like everybody to do, or you don't have to, but if you can count how many times I say the word lighthouse, perhaps there'll be a prize. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm going to read a little, I'm going to improvise a little, but I'm going to try to stand still and not speak too fast or too slow. So. Uh, I'd also uh, like to take a moment and acknowledge also that we are on Akwan Ani, and we're going to talk a lot about places in Southeast Alaska and other uh, indigenous lands, and I want to acknowledge that those are um, and always will be indigenous lands. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. I'm not a mariner, nor have I any professional experience maintaining aids to navigation. I have nothing but respect for men and women who make their living on the sea and I have an undying gratitude for those who have served and serve in our United States Coast Guard, as well as the Coast Guards of other nations. I'm a museum professional, the registrar at the Alaska State Museums, as Claire said. I have been a maritime heritage enthusi enthusiast, amateur boat builder, and lighthouse geek by happenstance. I just happened to be interning while in graduate school at the San Francisco Maritime National Historical Park. At the time, I was helping build exhibits on board of Balclutha, who, uh, well, there's probably not anybody here old enough to remember that it was an Alaska Packers Association vessel uh, by the name of Star of Alaska. And so we were building my first introduction to Alaska maritime history was helping build some of those exhibits. When I got a call from a friend who asked if I wanted to spend 10 days on a remote island in Alaska helping him clean up an old building, I you know, I don't know if I thought about lighthouses very much until that time. And I'm not even sure exactly how I feel about lighthouses today. But I had to say, yes, I love adventure. And it sounded like a great adventure. Like I said, I'm not sure how to feel about lighthouses today. I'm torn by the role of the lighthouse as a piece of a colonial infrastructure who was who extracted natural resources from this land and took it away to the metropole for the benefit of people far, far away. But at the on the other hand, lighthouses are an altruistic and hopeful message embodied in the symbolism of the shining light through the darkness. And then there is also the practical, though somewhat antiquated at this point, benefit to all mariners of that guiding light. So if you walk away from the, this talk thinking that this guy loves lighthouses, you're not going to be right. The truth is I am in love with a place. I'm in love with a place whose name I only just learned after 15 years. Uh, Ot Seat is a clinket name for what we call Cape Decision. It's on the south end of QU Island. And in 1932, the United States government built a lighthouse there. In 2005, I visited Ot Seat for the first time and I've been thinking about it just about every day since. If there had been a cannery, a fishing lodge, a soda fountain, or a prison there instead of a lighthouse, this would be a different talk. <laughs> I mostly want to share pictures tonight and some basic facts and stories about Alaska lighthouses. This won't be exhaustive. It might be exhausting. And I am not going to, uh, I'm not going to delve into technical matters of architecture, optics, or engineering. Uh, that's not my area of special, specialty, uh, and I know there's probably far more expertise in the audience tonight on some of these uh, matters than I. I'll finish the presentation uh, to, uh, tonight by focusing on um, some of the challenges and joys of pre preserving buildings in, the, uh, in remote locations. Okay. So, here we go in this... Uh, Mediocre graphic approximates the location of most of the lighthouses um, that, uh, ha that are and have been in Alaska. Um, 
Aids to navigation, whether artificial or natural, have undoubtedly been part of seafaring on the coasts of what we know as Alaska for as long as people have been navigating these waters. I would direct these, those interested in indigenous aids to navigation to other sources than me. Likewise, I would leave the history of Russian aids to navigation to others uh, or another time. The lighthouses I will discuss are those built in Alaska under the direction of the United States Lighthouse Board and later the United States Lighthouse Service and still later built and maintained by the United States Coast Guard. Three important aspects of my presentation are as follows. One, as I uh, just sort of hinted at, and, uh, uh, this, and as the subtitle suggests, this will not be a detailed history of each lighthouse, but just a quick overview. Two, my presentation is based on a resource here from the collection, uh, on the collect my, my presentation is based on a resource uh, from the Alaska State Museum, a scrapbook assembled by Florence Tobin Thornton, who was a clerk for the United States Lighthouse Service from 1921 till, till uh, and then later for the Coast Guard uh, up until I think 1950. As I stated before, I'm no expert. I make no claim to authority on lighthouses or Alaska maritime history. I like looking at pictures of boats and sometimes there are lighthouses in those pictures. So if I get a date wrong or something like that, if I mess up a detail, uh, just bear with me, get over it, or let me know later. Let's see, go. There we go. Um, like I said, uh, most, of the, uh, most of the photographs in my presentation come from this scrapbook. It was assembled by Florence Tobin Thornton. The, some of you might be familiar with the last name Tobin. Uh, Florence Tobin um, was the sister to Emery Tobin who founded the Alaska Sportsman's Magazine down in Ketchikan. Um, some of these, uh, while some of the photographs uh, Florence probably took, the vast majority of the photographs and other material were probably taken by her coworkers, and she assembled them into the scrapbook. Uh, as a clerk, she didn't travel to very many of the lighthouses or made probably only a handful of them. But she left notes, um, some of them made at the time, some of them probably made quite some time after, where some of the details might have gotten a little, little fuzzy. Other sources of photographs and information that I've used to create this presentation, excuse me, uh, from the fantastic website lighthousefriends.com. It's an exhaustive history and very detailed of each lighthouse, I think, in the country. Um, but they've got great information. Um, I've used uh, material from the Cape Decision Lighthouse Society archives. Um, put quotes there because we don't really collect things, uh, but people still give us things. <laughs> uh, the United, United States Coast Guard Historian's Office, the Alaska State Library Historical Collections, of course, uh, and my own personal art photographs. Oh, and as well, I got some great photos from Gary Gillette uh, from the Sentinel, or from the Gasno Historical, Gasno Channel, Channel Historical Society. Very brief history, just so we get a sort of timeline uh, straight. Uh, the lighthouses have been managed by a number of different agencies, um, and the one that we're talking about mostly that's covered by the scrapbook here is this, uh, is it, did it do anything? No. Is the uh, 1910 and 1939 um, US Lighthouse Service um, period. So who was Florence E. Tobin Thornton? Um, Florence Tobin was born in 1898 in Boston to Swedish immigrants' parents. Um, her, like I said, her brother was Emery Tobin. Um, there's a lake in Ketchikan named after him, as well as the beloved founder of Alaska Sportsman's Magazine. Um, in late, initially in 1920, her brother and father had gone to Ketchikan and worked for Nevco, the New England Fish Company. and uh, saved up money and then sent for Florence and her mother. Shortly after that, Florence got a job as a clerk for the United States Lighthouse Service. There's some, um, she married later in life to a guy named Thornton, I guess. Um, 
And she worked for the uh, Alaska State Legislature here in Juneau, traveled the world uh, teaching typing, and died in 1989 in Woodburn, Oregon. <laughs> One thing uh, you'll notice about this picture, which is from about 1930, is all the snow on the ground. She apparently also had an incredible tolerance for cold <laughs> uh, without her sleeves. So there's some pictures later with the, her coworkers, and they're all like bundled up, and she's just standing without sleeves. Um, another really interesting thing that I wasn't able to confirm and sort of is, is uh, an interesting tidbit is that her obituary notes that she was the first woman drawn for jury duty in Alaska in 19, I, I, I couldn't quite tell, but it might have been 1921 or 1922 or somewhere in there. But again, I couldn't, I tried, I scoured the archives and couldn't confirm this. Um, a, a couple of uh, photographs from her scrapbook. Um, this sort of uh, just gives a feel for the, uh, the folks that were working for the United States Lighthouse Service. You see the ad administrative staff uh, on the right. Um, you see there, everybody bundled up and uh, with their jackets on except for Florence. Um, the other two photos are the uh, uh, laborers, carpenters, blacksmiths, and uh, something that I was not familiar with this term, but uh, uh, Florence notes it uh, in uh, right here, a mechanician, um, which I couldn't, uh, never heard that term. I figured it was something like a cross between a technician and a magician. But uh, I guess it's probably more like a machinist, somebody who is, um, uh, knows about machines. The United States Lighthouse Service was uh, in Alaska, was headquartered in Ketchikan um, in 1920. Uh, its headquarters was built just uh, south of downtown Ketchikan. That building today is now the United States Coast Guard Base Ketchikan. Um, here are two photos, an aerial shot, uh, probably from the 30s. Um, I couldn't tell if the, well, actually that's for the, I'll do the ask that question in the Ketchikan presentation. But um, the other uh, photo is looking from the docks back down to, to downtown Ketchikan, the bow of the uh, tender alder is just in view here. So the next part of the uh, presentation, I'm just going to barrel through photos of every lighthouse in uh, Florence Tobin's album. She got had photos of nearly every uh, lighthouse uh, existing in her time, and uh, she only missed one. That is sort of a mystery. Um, but I'm just going to give basic facts and a couple of quick stories. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is a Five Finger Lighthouse. It's um, north of Cake and kind of north, northwest of Petersburg. It was the first lighthouse established in Alaska in 1902. It was rebuilt in 1935, automated in 1984. Today it's cared for by the Five Finger Lighthouse Society. Oh, by the way, if there's anybody here from an organization take, caring for a, a uh, a lighthouse today, when I get to your lighthouse, raise your hand so that people, uh, and maybe at the end we can have a little uh, intro. Um, but um, I I'll pause here for a second and you'll see this pattern. Um, there was a, uh, sort of waves of lighthouse construction and, uh, and reconstruction uh, throughout the 20th century. It was sort of the first wave is in the uh, 19, nine, beginning in 1902 up to 1916 or so, and then in the 19, late mid 20s uh, through the mid 40s, you see a, a period of rebuilding. And when they rebuilt uh, lighthouses, they went from. Is this showing? Can you guys see my pointer? No. Maybe I need to turn. It. How about now? You guys? Okay, yeah. So you see the 1902 lighthouse. It's a wood building, sort of all one. Structure, you see this pattern in, in a number of the early lighthouses in Southeast. Um, and then most of the lighthouses, when they were re replaced in the 20s and 30s, are the ones that you see today, which are these sort of pared down Art Deco concrete structures. Uh, the lighthouses in Alaska were sort of concentrated in a number of areas. Um, I mean, it's sort of astounding for such a big coastline we had, I think, at any given Point, the most lighthouse, active lighthouses was 16 at one point, where compared that to Michigan with significantly less coastline, 
and uh, they have nearly 250 lighthouses. Um, and so they were, the lighthouses were concentrated around important uh, areas for uh, bringing in uh, for navigation. Um, so um, the entrances and in, entrances into Ketchikan, uh, into the uh, Alaska portion of the Inside Passage, was quite important. So I've sort of broken down um, the sort of our talk tonight in sort of these groupings. Um, and what, another early lighthouse uh, is the Lincoln Rock Lighthouse, established in 1903. It was damaged severe, in a severe storm in 1909. Um, it was never rebuilt. It was replaced by an uh, automated light skeletal tower and uh, then deactivated in, the 19, in 1968. Uh, Lincoln Rock is in Stevens Passage near Edelin Island, sort of straight across from Kaufman Cove, Prince of Wales. Tree Point has the distinction of uh, being the only, well, I guess, remaining lighthouse on the Alaska mainland. All the other lighthouses are on islands. Um, there was one other that was built on the mainland, although it is uh, no longer in existence. Um, you can see the lens, the Fresnel lens, the original lens for this lighthouse at the uh, Ketchikan Totem, or Tongass uh, Historical Museum. Uh, Mary Island is very, uh, it's 1930s version is very similar to the, uh, to the lighthouse at Tree Point. It's also similar to Sentinel Island and sort of used maybe some sort of stock designs and modified them very little. The original one was also sort of a stock design of this uh, wood construction octagonal with a tower. Um, the, as you all may know, the lens from this lighthouse is up at our uh, city museum and can, I believe, it's on display. Um, an odd tidbit, this is one of four lighthouses that I've been to. Um, I was there in uh, 2014. And this is the strangest thing. There's a room in the tower full of dead birds. Uh, another lighthouse near Ketchikan is uh, Guard Island Lighthouse. And this one is interesting um, because it's so close to Ketchikan. I think it may have been one of the only or the only lighthouse that Florence Tobin actually visited. And she's there. you can see there's a lot more uh, in her album. There's a lot more sort of homey um, pictures. And probably because of its proximity to Ketchikan as well as its, uh, um, well, uh, because of its proximity to Ketchikan, was easily visited by um, non-field staff. Uh, the lighthouse here is apparently, although I could not find any contact information for them, is owned and operated by a Guard Island Heritage Incorporated. And I think at some point in the, new, in the recent past, they have run tours there. Uh, next, we're going to shift up to this area. as another, um, another area of concentration of lighthouse building. Um, and I'm sure many of you in the room here are familiar with these structures. Uh, Sentinel Island, um, you see uh, the, the photograph on the left here was uh, left uh, is from Florence Tobin's album, another uh, supplementing it from the Alaska State Library and some from the, uh, Gary Gillette with the Gasno Channel Historical Society. Um, I want to get to the next one because this uh, uh, highlights some of the recent uh, work that is uh, being done in historic preservation. Um, Gary was kind enough to uh, share some of these photos in just the nick of time so I can include, it, can include them tonight. Um, he uh, wanted to highlight one of the projects that last year they replaced the vent ball on top of the lantern room. Um, and you can see, I just love seeing these before and after photos because even though it's pretty small, it makes a huge impact when it comes to historic preservation. So thanks, Gary. Another area, uh, lighthouse in the uh, Juneau area is uh, Point Retreat. It was first built in 1903. But it wasn't really, a, I mean, it was a light station and had a sort of pillar with an automated acetylene torch, I believe, in 1903. And then in 1923, you can see the, uh, the sort of lighthouse tower proper was built. 
Uh, Point Retreat is uh, owned and has been uh, is under restoration by the Alaska Lighthouse Association. Point Sherman, it was probably the only other uh, lighthouse on the Alaska mainland. However, it was established in 1904, automated in 1911, and totally scrapped uh, for a day mark in 1932. Eldred Rock, um, now you all probably uh, have heard quite a, quite a lot of activity out of the Eldred Rock Preservation Association. This is so exciting. Um, this is one of the few lighthouses I've been to, and it is truly a gem, not just in maritime, Alaska maritime history, but in uh, sort of the built history of Alaska. It's a really special space. I think they have such an exciting opportunity and prospect um, to have a, a, a structure like this on the uh, you know, so-called tourist trail with the uh, potential to bring scads of people there um, once they've uh, sort of mitigated the toxic legacy um, from the chemicals and paint, heavy metals and that sort of thing. I am told, however, when I was there of three or four years ago, the biggest uh, obstacle to humans visiting was the smell from the land otters that had taken up residence inside. Um, but I'm told that that was, uh, um, that was uh, taken care of. I just, I just think this is such a wonderful uh, such a wonderful place. It could really, uh, you know, show the way. It could be a bright, you know, shining light or like a lighthouse for the rest of us uh, in the uh, historic preservation field. Next, uh, uh, talk about Cape Spencer. Now we're sort of left the Juneau area and we've come to the sort of other types, other sort of area of lighthouses and that's at the ocean entrances. Um, Cape Spencer is at the entrance of Cross Sound and um, it was one of the later uh, established lighthouses in uh, 1925. Um, certainly probably the isolation and uh, complicated logistics involved there um, led to its later construction. This is one of the uh, <laughs> one of the ones that uh, Tobin had a um, special note about Cape Spencer. Oh, by the way, the lens is in our gallery over here, which is not open right now, but you'll have to come see it some other time. But Tobin had a clipping from the Fairbanks News Miner um, that proclaimed that, quote, no one ever reported sober for his year's duty at Cape Spencer. <laughs> uh, undoubtedly, it would have been the last drink they had for a year, um, unless they smuggled some contraband on, onto the rock. I also can't imagine that was, this is the only lighthouse that it was ever said about. Here's the Mystery Lighthouse, uh, Fairway Island. Uh, it is uh, kind of between uh, Angoon and Sitka. It was built in 1904 and deactivated sometime in 1912. Um, there's not, that's about, I haven't seen a picture. Most of the sources that I was able to look at didn't uh, have any further information. Yeah. Uh, somebody has left their car lights on. Their car lights on in the garage. The Rav Four Toyota. N H. Toyota Corolla, going once and twice. <laughs> All right. All right. Only a few more to go. We'll get um, uh, another grouping of lighthouses. Uh, uh, well, a pair of lighthouses is at Unimac Pass in the Eastern Aleutians. Um, while there are a few lighthouses in Alaska, their locations illustrates, their location illustrates some of the important developments in Alaska history and colonial economy. Unimac Pass is one of the most heavily trafficked waterways in the world, and it keeps getting busier. It is the widest and most convenient place, uh, or of the passes through the Lucerne chain, chain uh, for vessels traveling the Great Circle Route, which 
the great circle root, I'm sure everybody knows, is the geometric, or geom geometric quirk that dictates the shortest distance between two points on a sphere is not a straight line, but an arch. Let's, let's not think about that too hard right now. Um, <laughs> if you have a globe, it works out on a globe. Uh, um, so while, it's, uh, while the, one of the original purposes of these two lighthouses uh, were for, to provide access for ships coming into the fisheries of Bristol Bay and the Bering Sea, um, no doubt they also play a critical role in guiding international trade between Asia and North America. Uh, one of the other lighthouses that I've had the privilege of visiting uh, is Scotch Cap, um, or what was what's left of Scotch Cap. Um, this is probably the story uh, of Scotch Cap, maybe well known to uh, many of you who have an interest in um, uh, maritime history in Alaska. Uh, you see, there have been pretty much three lighthouses in Scotch Cap. I think it's the only place in Alaska that has had three. You see the original, again, a hexag hexagonal wooden structure, followed, replaced in 1944 by, uh, a, again, an art sort of pared down Art Deco concrete uh, building, um, which only two years later was obliterated uh, by a tsunami on April 1st and killed, killing five Coast Guardmen. That structure uh, was replaced in the 1950s by an unimpressive uh, sort of concrete bunker style building with a skeletal tower that is still mostly there today. Um, which, and then it was replaced, I think, in uh, sometime after that by a uh, just automated light on a, um, on a, po on a pole. Sister lighthouse to uh, Scotch Cap is Cape Sarashef, is on the uh, Bering Sea side of Unimac Pass. It, uh, it actually, if, when you look at photos of the two sites, the historic photos, it's sort of hard to tell them apart. They were so similar. An interesting thing you can see in this photos that was also in, in Scotch Cap were these uh, living quarters. Um, they were constructed for uh, not only the keepers, assistant keepers, but also their families, which it was the custom for many in, in the United States Lighthouse Service for families to live with the keepers. However, they quickly realized after building Cape Sarashef and Scotch Cap that they were far too remote and the difficulties of getting even mail ashore on the, uh, on the uh, sort of through the pounding surf here made uh, sort of it disqualified uh, these sites from having uh, families join their uh, join their uh, the employees. The uh, that led to a sort of in these remote stations led to a, an interesting work schedule. Uh, lighthouse service uh, keepers and assistant keepers were assigned to Cape Sarashef and Scotch Cap for three years at a time. So they'd be out there for three years and then they'd get a whole year off. Um, but there's numerous, uh, numerous stories of drownings uh, related to supplying um, both of these lighthouses, and it's so it's no wonder that uh, they never really used the family quarters. Uh, moving on, uh, the, there's a couple of lighthouses uh, situated around the uh, Prince William Sound area. Uh, first is Cape Hitchinbrook on Hitchinbrook Island. It was established in 1910. And you can see the original one. It was almost immediately threatened uh, due to erosion and earthquakes. Uh, in, Florence, uh, in Florence Tobin's album, she notes on the uh, back of this photo that uh, the keepers and assistant keepers had built shanties well back from the edge of the cliff for, so that they could sleep in safety without fear of, of falling in. So um, they quickly noted that and, re and it was uh, rebuilt, uh, you know, probably before it needed to be, but in uh, 1934 from a structural standpoint. And I actually think uh, it probably was one of the, kind of had a little bit more ornament, it seems like, than some of the others. Um, and uh, the lens uh, for this lighthouse is actually uh, 
owned by the Alaska State Museum and is on loan to the, uh, muse the community museum in Valdez. I want to share a story, though, that this also comes from a piece, uh, a different resource here at the Alaska State Museum, is that we have the uh, last or the, the the last visitor register uh, for the Cape Hitchinbrook Lighthouse, and I just I, I noticed that and I went to I was like oh I'll read that and see if there's anything interesting because most of it's just people entering their names. There's some interesting ones from shipwreck people, and all of a sudden you get. 30 people from all over who had, you know, their ship had run aground and they were taking shelter in the lighthouse. But the interesting story came in the last two entries, um, 1974, August 14th and 15th. Um, one is uh, by officer in charge, boatswain's mate, first class, William H. Uh, Otto. The other is by Ricky E. Bucksteiner. Otto described in detail and clearly shaky hand um, this quote, upon direct orders, station dogs Red and Snowball were laid to rest. They were good dogs and were brave to the end. They were good coasties. They seemed to, seemed to know what was happening. God forgive us for taking their lives. Buck Steiner was more to the point in his assessment of the order. The guard effed up here. The dogs were loyal, but the latter wasn't. That was the last entry in the Hitchinbrook Light visitor log. It's now in the collection here. On, as they were automating the lighthouse, um, the uh, auto received orders that the dogs by no means were allowed to ride in the helicopter. And so they, uh, they had to put them down and uh, weren't, weren't too happy about it. The full story of Red and Snowball plus pictures of them uh, can be found online on the Lighthouse, lighthouse Digest magazine, September and October edition uh, 2018. The other lighthouse in the sort of Prince William Sound area is on uh, Kayak Island uh, at Cape St. Elias. This is again one of the sort of later lighthouses established. Um, today it's managed by the Cape St. Elias Lighthouse Keepers Association based in Cordova. They've got a really cool website. Apparently you can, you can if you can get there, you can rent out, uh, rent out the lighthouse, but I'd love to know more about that. Uh, finally, the last lighthouse and the one nearest and dearest to my heart if, um, that feels like home to me is Cape Decision. Um, like I said at the beginning of my talk, I'm not that into lighthouses. I'm into boats, adventure, and looking at animals. In 2005, in 2005 I found the best place of all that I've ever been to see those things. It's Ot Seat. In 1700, whatever George Vancouver decided, the Spanish had not charted the coast north of what he didn't know was already called Ot Seat, a name in reference to a high forbidding island directly south named Ot. According to scholars, according to scholars familiar with the Kuyukwan place names from Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. The Cape Decision Lighthouse was the last lighthouse established in Alaska. It was completed in 1932. It was automated in 1974, again, about that same time. as Most of the others were automated. It was uh, first automated with using remotely controlled diesel generators and later, and still to this day, is uh, uh, operated with solar panels. Since 1997, uh, the lighthouse and surrounding acreage has been cared for by the Cape Decision Lighthouse Society, of which I'm vice president. The group was formed initially and predominantly by fishermen um, and residents of Port Alexander and Sitka. And over the last few years has transitioned to a bit more scattered membership and leadership. Over the years, volunteer work parties have steadily improved the conditions at the lighthouse uh, while also preserving what is left of the historic structure's fabric. For instance, last year, CDLS received a grant from the State Historic Preservation Office to have, professional, have a professional assessment of the lantern room conducted by the conservator. If you recall the pictures of um, Sentinel Island that uh, Gary shared with us that um, we're looking to do some, some restoration work uh, on our lantern room, which is that iconic structure on the top, uh, the very top of the lighthouse here. This assessment was completed last fall and has given us a roadmap to preserve uh, the lantern room. And I'm happy to say our, our 
uh, our contractor, conservator, Nicole Peters of Skagway, loved the place so much she caught the bug just like everybody who goes there and has joined our board and uh, can't wait to get her back out there. So it sort of concludes my sprint through all the Alaska lighthouses. Um, and I'm going to slow it down for a second and bring it back to some, bring it back to the people. There's a special power in the places where lighthouse st lighthouses stand. Perhaps it relates to the building, the symbolism, or maybe just the simple ability to look out from a high place at the world drifting by, or waves battering the rocks, or trollers rolling through the swell. In any case, the magic only happens when there's people in these places. And getting people to these places is no easy feat. For some reason, they don't put lighthouses in easy places to get to. In the past, that, uh, and in Florence Tobin's time, they had the ability to take big groups of people out on uh, uh, lighthouse tenders. And today, we operate in much the same way, except we don't have lighthouse tenders. To get people and equipment to lighthouses has always been a challenge. Uh, tenders and a variety of small boats were used by the United States Coast Guard, or the United States Lighthouse Service, and later the Coast Guard. And then in the 1960s, with the ad adoption of the helicopter and construction of helipads at most of the lighthouses in Alaska, uh, it allowed uh, the, the labor saving, the time saving uh, ability to automate most of those lighthouses. Today, with the lighthouses uh, preservation falling to nonprofit groups, helicopter travel is pretty much, uh, pretty much out of out of our pocketbook, I suppose. Um, here's a great photo of the uh, from Tobin's album of the uh, lighthouse tender fern uh, servicing a um, a light, an automated light in the Wrangell Narrows. Here's a, a smattering of other photos from Tobin's album uh, or from her scrapbook with some of the other watercraft. Um, like I said, this is, I like boats, so I had to throw these in. You have the, the alder the, here. We saw the bow of it up, tied up at the dock in Ketchikan. This is at Cape Decision. I know exactly where this is. It's at the end of the landing trail, about a mile from the lighthouse. Um, it's not that protected, and you can kind of tell because she's tied up at both ends. Um, here, this is at uh, uh, Scotch Cap, and they must have waited ages for weather good enough to do this, um, to be able to bring in a, a small boat like that and offload uh, those crates. And what's in those crates are replacement generators and, uh, for the, and compressors um, for, the, uh, um, for the light, for the fog signal. Um, which I can't tell how they, on earth, they got them out of that boat. But I guess there are a lot of, a lot of guys down there. Uh, the uh, this photo here is one of my favorites. Um, it uh, is, it notes in the scrapbook. This is Sam Olson. I couldn't find his name as one of the uh, keepers or assistant keepers at Eldred Rock, but that's where this photo is. It's near Eldred Rock, and that most, most almost certainly is uh, a double-ended Davis boat. We know uh, the Davis uh, and Son Boat Company out of Metlakatla built, uh, built small boats for the lighthouse services, lighthouse service over a number of years. Um, I'm not sure the lines you can tell. Um, that uh, we have a double-ended Davis boat in the collection at the Alaska State Museum. It's on display. It's often missed because it's way up high in the galleries. Um, kind of right as you turn the corner um, across from the Russian American section. The, oh, and for outboard nerds, I think that's a 1921 Elto uh, outboard uh, twin, light twin. Uh, here's a couple more boat, boat pictures. Uh, this one on the left here is uh, almost, again, another uh, most likely Davis boat built in Metlakatla being lift, hoisted up out of what we call the gut at uh, Cape Decision, it's a remarkable place um, where even when it's the wind and waves are thrashing outside, you can still, you can if you can get there, it's pretty calm in that in that little gut. Uh, 
This is, uh, middle picture is also uh, from Cape Decision a, a little later, probably from the late 40s or early 50s, uh, taken by a, a ex coastie named Ron Smith, who gave, sent us some, uh, at the Cape Decision Lighthouse Society, some uh, photos from his times there. I think this is probably the same boat um, from that photo. Um, the picture on the right is a more modern day and illustrates what, uh, how we get out to the lighthouse uh, since we don't have a helicopter and a budget besides the federal government. Um, we uh, hire uh, Eric Yancey out of Wrangell uh, with uh, Breakaway Adventures to take us out there in a, a jet boat that's probably better suited for the running up the Stikine, but uh, it does make for a fast ride, though sometimes a really lumpy ride. Um, and he just noses up to the rock, and we just sort of throw everything off onto the rocks and haul it up to the lighthouse. Here's a good, uh, just a quick comparison of uh, lighthouse life in the 1930s. This is at, uh, um, it must be a, uh, you know, maybe Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving. There's uh, probably a goose or some sort of waterfowl on the table, and the uh, uh, lighthouse keeper and the assistant and their, and their spouses sitting down to a nice refined meal. And then we have a work party of volunteers wolfing down whatever slop is uh, thrown in front of them in 2018. In the past, lighthouses warned mariners of hidden dangers or helped them guess their location on starless nights. Or they provided hope to those racing a storm across open water. Now these functions are largely handled by radar, GPS, and AI, AIS. Today, lighthouses are not just sim signals or symbols, for that matter. They're destinations, destinations for cultural tourism, science education, and adventure. The remoteness of Alaska lighthouses both makes them challenging to preserve and thrilling to visit. The Cape Decision Lighthouse Society is dedicated to preserving the lighthouse for multiple uses as well as the symbolic significance. CDLS has hosted university programs, outdoor leadership programs, as well as become a destination for adventure travelers seeking a unique challenge on the remote coast. In addition, CDLS is committed to expanding programming at the lighthouse with a strong eye towards providing access to the lighthouse and surrounding area to underserved communities. This, uh, this photo, it reminds me of something too. Um, this is a picture from about 2011. And this is the sort of converted troller Cape Decision. And on the bow there is uh, the uh, uh, former halibut fisherman and uh, owner of the legendary halibut schooner, the Grant, out of Seattle, who for years uh, fished in the Bering Sea in the Gulf of Alaska and he told a story once of every, every year on their run back to Seattle loaded down with fish. They're coming across the Gulf, and he knew that as soon as he saw the light from Cape Decision, that he was almost out of danger. And they were in, inside, and they were almost home. So when he retired from fishing and skippering, he didn't really retire. He bought a converted troller, and every summer he comes up and he named it Cape Decision to remind him uh, of how thankful he was to see that light. And Jack's story reminds me that that symbol of hope that is associated with lighthouses is based in reality. It's that light blinking in the dark, guiding and reassuring. That's it, thanks. I just put, I'm going to leave this up for a moment. The, these are uh, some of the lighthouse organizations. I think I have their contact info or websites at least uh, up. Um, so uh, I urge you all, if you're interested in these organizations or in maritime history or volunteering, um, to go there. I'm going to leave this up for about three more seconds, and then I'm going to turn to Cape Decision Lighthouse because I, was, I need to uh, plug my... Uh, own organization. But I'm happy to take questions um, now or later or whenever you like. 
I just have a quick question. Who's in possession of Florence Tobin's scrapbook? Oh, and it, can anyone look at it? It's in the Alaska State Museum. Um, I've uh, sort of uh, done a slipshod job of digitizing it. Um, but if uh, somebody would like to look at the real deal, um, an appointment can be made um, through contacting me um, or calling the front desk at the museum, and they can contact me. Yeah. What's the legal status of the nonprofits that own or manage or control the lighthouses? Uh, varied. Uh, Cape Decision, we own Cape Decision and the, uh, uh, the lighthouse and the re reserve around it, um, with the Coast Guard having a perpetual easement um, to uh, maintain the, the light that is actually still in the lantern room. Um, with um, I'm not too sure, certain on the other organizations. I sort of, in my presentation, sort of equivocated on saying owned uh, versus uh, cared for, or stewarded, or preserved by. So I would refer, um, I think there's, there's varied. You know, I think Eldred Rock, they're still owned by the Coast Guard, uh, but I think there's, and they're trying to work towards ownership or a long-term lease or something like that, for instance. So could you sell that to somebody that maybe wanted to put a lodge there? You know, it kind of makes me sick to my stomach thinking about that. Uh, but uh, uh, I think we probably could as long as they maintain that perpetual easement. There might be a clause that it needs to be uh, preserved for the public good. Um, if there isn't, that's how we operate anyway. So. Hi. Hi. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, earlier you mentioned that Five Finger Lighthouse is the oldest lighthouse in Alaska. Uh, and I was curious, um, I had heard that Point, or excuse me, Sentinel and Five Fingers supposedly were lit on the same day. Oh, that uh, <laughs> that is entirely possible. Oh, okay, I, I um, heard it was like some competition, and I'm yeah. just like curious. Well, if that's I believe true. they were both built in 1902, and I, I guess I should qualify that. Um, Five Finger was the first lighthouse established in Alaska, according to sources. Um, the structure there now is not that same structure. Eldred Rock is the oldest single lighthouse, okay. uh, although it was established a year later. Okay. So, but your Sentinel question, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Sounds plausible. I heard plausible. it was like a competition. Yeah. We're the oldest. Um, yeah. And then my other question is, of these remaining lighthouses, how many of them are used today for um, live weather and AIS. Oh, um, um, I'm looking to see. I was hoping Ed, pa Ed Page from the Marine Exchange could answer that question probably, but I didn't see him. Um, you know, I don't know, but uh, quite a few. Uh, Cape Decision, we have a Marine Exchange and a NOAA. Uh, AIS, uh, Marine Exchange does the AIS there. Uh, we also have a NOAA station, um, I think. There's one, uh, there's an AIS station at Mary Island. Um, I helped put one in at Scotch Cap. Um, so I don't, I don't know, but quite a few. I mean, they're, they're there for a reason. They're, they create, they're good structures that you can put uh, remote equipment in that are relatively protected. So I don't know if all of them, but uh, quite a few. Um, I didn't see the map for sure, but it looked like a lot of the lighthouses in Alaska were like mostly like the southern coast. Yeah, let me, I can, I can get back to like, yeah, most of them are in southeast for sure. Yeah, so there's, a, you know, a group around Ketchikan. Where am I here? A uh, group around Ketchikan, a group in Lynn Canal, and then a few at ocean entrances. Like any, like up oh. north of the oh, like, like northern Alaska? Like, no, no, that's why I didn't include nothing in the Bering Sea, nothing in the, uh, you know, on the North Slope, nothing up there. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> I was just going to clarify a couple of questions that I had that yeah. I heard. Um, 
Sentinel, I'm Gary Gillette with the oh, Sentinel yeah, hey, Island Lighthouse. And uh, Sentinel Island and Five Fingers, according to the Coast Guard historian, were um, funded, contracted, and lit ultimately on the same day. So Congress funded those two at the same time. Gotcha. It's something we always have to share. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, the question uh, about uh, ownership, um, and I believe it's in all of the um, contracts or quit claim deeds, if the nonprofit abandons it or decides not to do it or the Coast Guard determines that not, they're not uh, preserving it as intended, it reverts back to the federal government. Gotcha. The federal governments, um, they first start to find a, a federal agency to take them over, then they go to the state agencies, they actually go to the locals, and if they don't get any response, then they go out to nonprofits, and if they get no response to nonprofits, they actually put them up for bid. Mm -hmm. And some of them down south have uh, gone that far and are in private ownership. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks for clarifying that, Gary. There's a uh, question. Which of the lighthouses, I don't know if there's an easy answer, um, can you reserve and are like open to tourism or you know you can spend the night at? Um, well, I think Sentinel is, um, and I believe uh, Cape St. Elias is. I don't know of any others that our Cape decision is not, um, but it's pretty easy to get there if you just call me up. We, I mean, it's not easy to get there. It's real hard. <laughs> or it's real expensive one way or the other. But, uh, yeah. There was a question down in front. Go ahead. I've been to a lot of the lighthouses, but what is AIS? Hey, uh, oh, geez. <laughs> I knew this. Um, it's a radio operated. Somebody, somebody's got to know in the audience here, right? AIS. It is. What does it stand for? Thank you. Automated identification system. It's a radio-based um, a, a receiver or transponder is put on a, a ship, and it they have to have shore-based oh. facilities, and it can give very precise locations for ships. It's used by a lot of shipping companies to keep track of their vessels. The Marine Exchange here in yeah. of Alaska, uh, tr it has a, is every, somebody is always there tracking ships. Um, I think on contract for the Coast Guard now, especially in the Aleutians, you know, they can monitor the speed of a tanker transiting Unimac Pass, and if that all of a sudden stops, goes dead in the water, they can get on and email the captain being like, hey, is everything all right? And they're able to, to um, dispatch, uh, you know, uh, rescue equipment and that sort of thing. It's, I uh, believe, just a very, it's far more accurate than GPS and quick. Yeah. Over here. Not so much a question, it's just uh, hard to believe that that's the busiest waterway in the world. Well, I, did, I said one of the busiest waterways in the world, but it really is, no, and it is, uh, it's, I think, I read somewhere 5,000 oil tankers a year go through there, which, you know, for a place that is, I mean, I've been there, stood there, like, it is windswept, it is inhospitable, um, uh, it's oddly beautiful, but it's amazing to see the, the amount of world trade passing through the tankers, the cargo ships with containers full of plastic nonsense that's just, you know, one mishap away from wrecking the whole place, really. But. Andrew, you said Lighthouse 116 times. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you win. You win, Lizzie. I'll buy you, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> I was practicing, and I'm like, if I say Lighthouse one more time, I, I wish there was, there's no other... There's no other word. <laughs> Any other questions? I would uh, invite you all, please, if you know more about this subject and want to talk about it, I want to talk to you. Um, and uh, I'd love it if some other folks would like to come and talk about their uh, lighthouse or their experience. 
um, at lighthouses. Oh. Yes, sir. Uh, this is just uh, a point of information. Yes, sir. I, uh, I had a little tiny pocket radio and I was fooling around with the bands and I don't know what I was doing. And I got some sort of a shortwave band, some channel seven, and it gives the marine forecast all around yep. and a nice climate summary of Juno for the Navy Four. Mm -hmm. So in case anybody wants to do that, just look around on a, on a little yeah. radio like that. Yeah, and you can get the wind speed at Marmion Island. And the water temperature, too, out <laughs> yeah. there in the Marmion the Island. five fingers and so uh -huh. on. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Any other questions, comments, corrections? Well, thanks. Thanks, you all. I have... Uh, if anyone would uh, like a, a postcard, old postcard from Cape Decision, I've got plenty here. And I'm also going to go back to my last slide. Please follow us on Facebook or email us or anything like that if you'd like to come out to the lighthouse, bring a group. Oh, yeah. I can, oh, yeah. Okay. Fine. Fine. <laughs> All right. No, they. Uh, I'm sure they would all love to hear from you, and uh, um, some of these are a lot closer, closer to home. Yes, sir. Oh, which which lighthouse? Cape At Cape Decision, there were so. Oh yeah, the the question was about uh, two diesel generators that uh, were bound for Cape Decision, bound for Cape Decision and never made it. Oh wow. And the only way you could get to that place, I don't know how you get there now. But yeah. You go in it, you get into a basket out in that little cove. Uh huh. And they hoist you up. Yep. And then you can walk to the light or to the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the quarters. Right, right. Um, well, somebody came in and stole the two generators. Off the dock at Cape Decision? Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. Well, so there was, um, when we first got there, there were, or when I first visited in 2005, there were three, three big generators, a... Uh, an uh, Onan gen set, big and they were AC or thing. DC? Jeez, uh, no, I'm <laughs> um, Yeah, you'd have to talk to our board president. He's the, um, he's the mechanician in our crew. Um, I, uh, I just uh, give talks and stuff like that. But there, then we had two Lister generators. That, those were the ones that had been... Uh, the small, for small. They yeah, they, they were... Right, that was just during the automated days. Um, the other gen set was for the house and... See, we serviced that when it was still had five or six people. Oh, wow. Operating. Same wow. way with Point Retreat and all of them. Yeah, wow. And, uh, but... Uh, well, how'd you, how'd you guys get out there and, uh, on the, on the tender? On the stores. On the stores. Oh, wow. Do you have any photos of the stores out there at Cape yeah, D? Yeah, there's or? a whole bunch of them up at the uh, district office. Oh, cool. And I cool. think in the uh, historical department of the library. Uh, oh, right. State cool, library. Right. Great, great. But uh, another thing is, is you uh, keep uh, talking about Elder Rock. Yeah. To the north, uh, I'm going to say northeast corner of the island. Mm hmm Right by the, uh, where the ramp comes down. Yeah. In 400 feet of water, there's a Alaska coastal grumman goose. At the oh, bottom. wow. One of our pilots came in there and he wasn't watching. He was making an approach and he turned too, f too steep and tucked a wing into the water. And then a cartwheeled in and Whoa. him and one passenger got out. And I think there was one passenger, uh, elderly lady going to Haines uh, is probably still in the, air, in the airplane. Whoa. Because it was too deep there. In 1955, 56, they uh, didn't have the uh, equipment to, oh, wow. to go down that deep. Wow. But uh, yeah, basically, uh, Montour over here probably is on doing a lot more 
to the uh, light stations than I did. I more or less uh, was a crew member on the stores uh, doing what the, what the district uh, wanted. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he, he was in part of probably uh, in the installation of the lights when it was uh, switched from DC to AC gotcha. and, and automated. Yeah. And, uh, thanks, thanks for sharing. So, I got all kinds of stories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear some. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I got orders from headquarters not to talk too long. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing. Thank you for your service, sir. Yeah, thank you. Any other, any other questions, comments? All right. Thank you all again, uh, appreciate it. Thanks for being patient.